morning, everybody, and thanks very much indeed for the opportunity to speak this morning, particularly to Alma and Sarah. Uh, there was no coercion involved at all, um, at least that I can talk about. Um, Seamus reminded me that the last time we met was about 10 years ago when we came down to celebrate Clara ICH completing the public home under the warmer home scheme that I worked in with, with Alma. Um, that scheme has now gone on to do over 150,000 houses in the country with free attic and wall insulation for homes that are at risk of energy poverty. And I don't think 10 years ago we ever thought those figures would have been achievable. So it just shows you the, the power of collaboration and working well together. So the programme I work in, uh, I suppose just to give you a quick introduction. There we go. Um, about SEAI, for those who don't know about us, we're the National Energy Authority. We were established in 2002 formally. Prior to that, we were known as the Irish Energy Centre. Um, our mission is to play a leading role in transforming Ireland into society. Based on sustainable energy structures, technologies and practices. Nearly slips off the tongue, not quite yet though. Um, just to give you some idea of the context of why we think energy is as important as it is for Ireland. You can see there the figures for 2015, which are the last national figures we have. So as a country, we imported 88% of our energy needs. That went up 3% on 2014, so it's going the wrong way for us. Um, now price is a big uh, factor in that, so what we buy in and what price we can afford to buy it at. <coughs> we exported 4.6 billion euro of our money to pay for that energy, which is substantial. And that did drop quite considerably, almost by 20% on the previous year. Again, due to pricing, not through anything unfortunate that we can control. For our electricity, renewables provided 22.8% of our electricity supply and wind was the vast majority of that and that has increased 4.6% of the year before. So that's definitely going in a very positive direction. Um, for each householder, to give you some context of how much carbon we all emit, it's about five and a half tonnes of carbon dioxide per home per year. That's come down quite a bit by about 30% um, over the last 10 years. So it is going in the right direction, um, but it's still quite a substantial amount. The reason we're running our sustainable energy peace programme is the energy model for Ireland is changing and we all need to be part of it. Um, we need to future-proof our lives, our homes, our businesses, and that we believe communities can lead that transition. So Ireland launched an energy white paper in December 2015, um, and it's Ireland's roadmap <coughs> to a low-carbon future by 2050. We'd like to get there sooner, but that's the, that's the policy document that's there. The word map that's up there is of the executive summary, so it shows you <coughs> the words that are most often quoted in that. And you can see that community citizens, consumers, we working together are all part of that. That's relatively unusual for a government policy document that the citizen is very much at the heart of it. And the intent behind our programme is to engage and empower communities. When I say we, myself and my colleague Gillian Gannon run the SEC programme, so she's, she's here as well today. So if you want to talk to either of us at any stage, please feel free to do so. So the Sustainable Energy Programme was actually set up in 2006 under an Interreg Concerto programme. Uh, it was run from 2006 to 2011 and was run with the intent of engaging local authorities around Ireland to develop sustainable energy zones and to demonstrate best practice in renewable and sustainable energies. In 2012, we got some, that had come to an end and we got some, an opportunity to do a grant programme. So we're given less than 2 million euros to try a pilot and to do it in about four months. So we've been working with local authorities very successfully up to that point, but it was felt that maybe there was others out there that could actually lead community projects as well. So we, we opened it up to all. That programme delivered €3 million Euro worth of work in the first year, so we funded about 60% of the total cost of the work, and it's now grown into a €30 million Euro a year grant programme. So that's from 2012 to 2016. So it's quite a huge trajectory of what communities have expressed an ambition and ability to do. So back in 2015, we identified a need to enable communities to keep up with these kind of projects and empower more communities to engage. We're seeing certain communities come back again and again and grow from strength to strength, but other communities were getting left behind. So we reinvigorated the SEC programme to try and find support framework for communities to start take the first few steps on the journey um, and get access to that money and make the most of it. So we've broadly defined a sustainable energy community as where a group of people come together to work to develop the sustainable energy systems crucially for the benefit of the community. And to do so, they look at energy efficiency first, then consider renewable options where feasible, and finally then go on and look at decentralised energy supplies or potentially smart grid options. So that's the order that we ask people to look at a project. So if you're coming first with a smart grid project, we'll ask you to have you checked all the attics? Have you considered other elements of the building fabric within your community before you start there? And try and start at the start and work through in a, in a structured way. So the program has two levels. The first level is the network. So we launched the network late in 2015. And that's just for people who are interested. So if you're a community group, a community development organisation, tidy towns, group border scheme, we do have a couple. Um, the idea is if you just want to find out what's happening within energy at community level, join the network. 
It's not legally binding, you're just on a mailing list for newsletters, events. And you have the opportunity to share and learn from other people and see how they're doing. So myself and Gillian attended an event yesterday in the southwest region and we had about 60 to 70 interested community attendees come along and they're actually brought on the site visit to a wind farm, a swimming pool and a heat pump installation. And that was in the pool. And so they got they, they got to see three case studies live in action and they got to share ideas and Gillian even remarked when they were getting off the bus at the end of the day, all the cross sharing of ideas and phone numbers and swapping and wanting to go out and visit each other to see what's happening. And we're just trying to facilitate that to work that people can share and learn from each other. And that's very much share the good and the bad. We want to we want to repeat the good stuff and avoid mistakes. The second level which we're working on actively this year is looking for those communities to consider joining a partnership with SAI where we can provide them with funding and technical support. So we have four applications in that myself and Jim will be looking at very soon. And through that process we can offer free technical advice. So we have a panel of technical advice available. We can offer funding to do energy master planning and they can work with us on annual work plans to say look these are the activities we want to do, how can you support us. And it just these are the pioneers that we're supporting, so there will be learnings, there will be failures, and we just have to make sure that we make the most of the ones that work and share those back across the, the other communities. So that's the map of the communities across Ireland as they are now. So you can see they're pretty much all across the country. Bit of a gap around the Wexford area, but we're working on that. And each one of those dots, when you go onto that map on our website, actually brings you up some information about the community itself. So it's information they provided to us. Caroline's there. <laughs> so there she is. So obviously I tailored it for the local audience. This is your, your Westport SEC. Um, but every one of those has information about what that community is hoping to achieve. And as they go through it and learn more, we can put up more information about them on it. So this is how the network has grown and just showing the level of activity that's there is that by the end of 2015, we had 13 SECs and we were delighted. Uh, by the end of 2016, there was 60 and I'm starting to get a bit worried. Julian came on board last month, so it's not, it's not as uh, intimidating anymore. We had 76 up to yesterday. It's growing at a couple a week. Uh, I'd like us to have about 120 by the end of this year, but if we get 360, we'd be delighted as well. But that's just a target for us so that we can allocate our resources around. When we had 60 communities, we did a quick check of what those communities were spending in energy themselves. And there's two ways of looking at it. There's the energy that people use themselves, it's the energy you use in your home, it's the energy you use to get to work, but it's also the energy you have the ability to influence. So we often forget that when we're at work, or at leisure, we also influence the energy that's being used there. And if we ask for energy projects to be undertaken, you have the ability to, to lead an awful lot more. The example I gave yesterday in the room was that a gentleman said he was going to leave the event and he was going to talk to three to four people and he was going to make them change how they thought about energy. And if everyone in the room did the same today, you have the opportunity to influence over a million euro and spend yourselves. So 50 people talking to four people can influence a million euro in energy spend. And it's very easy to save somebody 10%. It's very reasonable to save somebody 30%. So you have the potential in the room today to save 300,000 euro on energy spend without asking anyone to sit in the dark or the cold. It's not about that. It's the greatest level of immunity with the lowest environmental impact. And that's the balance of trying to find that and optimising it. So our 60 communities have the ability to influence half a billion euro on energy spend. Now, if you save that 20%, that's a, I'm throwing loads of numbers in, I'm sorry. That's 100 million euro that you can save in your communities that stays here and doesn't go abroad. That's a huge programme of investment and that's every single year. That's a recurring value to the community. So the impact is, is massive that can be achieved through this. So quite often people get involved in this because the finances make sense <coughs> or there's a grant there and that's what's attractive. But what people always tell us after they've done work, be it in their community buildings, their work or their home, is the comfort and the greater means that they get from that. So whether that's they can turn their heating on and off remotely or that when they come home the evening their house isn't cold, or they wake up to a warmer house or they feel healthier in their home, all of those things are things people remember afterwards. The money becomes very secondary to that. So the supports that we can offer when they're in the partnership, we actually ask people who've led the grant programmes in the early days, what skills did they feel they need or they had to hire to make the project successful? So they came back with these seven core skills. The ones you'd expect, energy efficiency skills, renewable energy, smart grid up to a point and sustainable transport. And then the ones that we were considering the non-technical skills that they thought they needed was the ability to build strong partnerships locally. So how they could get people to collaborate with them and share the project planning and engagement with them. How they could look at integrated planning. So that could be how their project fits into a local development plan, even a national development plan, a local energy strategy program, or even how if somebody else is doing some work, so if the local school was getting a new roof for some reason, 
that somebody knew enough to say, well, maybe we should upgrade the insulation and the lighting at the same time and integrate that plan to maximise that opportunity. And then finally, the strategic financing. And it was a fancy way of saying, how can we get communities supported without grants? So life after grants, how can we ensure that whatever project they're doing is self-sustaining going forward into the future as best we can? The grants that we support typically pay themselves off in three to four years. So they make economic sense without a grant, but the grant gives people <coughs> the ability to prove the concept of what they're doing. It gets the ability to, to get confidence within the community that's leading the project. But it's not critical to the success financially. So what opportunities started to go after other funding? Is an opportunity for communities to work together and go after European projects, very much like what's happening here today. So it's strengthening the projects to go after other funding in addition to our own and move beyond the proof of concept stage. So we would say that there's a journey that each community goes on and the first one we'd ask is that there's a commitment. So you develop a community charter locally. So that's asking your community that's involved in your sustainability community, what do they hope to achieve? For some, like the Iron Islands, that's becoming carbon neutral by 2022 and they're well on their way. For the likes of, say, a smaller, more rural community that's more concerned about the households, that could be eliminating energy poverty locally. So it's the ambition that the community wants to share. It can be multiple objectives, as long as they're energy related, we're happy with that. But it, it focuses the mind on what projects they go after at a later stage, if everyone understands the destination of their journey. There's the partnership agreement that's there. And then once you're in the partnership, the idea is to develop an energy master plan. So that's possibly doing a survey of all the energy users in your community. You define your community. It doesn't have to be geographical. So um, it could, for example, be all the members of a tennis club. So they may not live beside each other, but they all come together. The tennis club may do some energy upgrades, and then all the members of it would agree to do something themselves, both at work and at home. So you define it. As I said, there can be multiple communities in the same area as well. Plan, so establish the goals and the work programs. So what projects can you realistically deliver on? What partners do you need to make that successful? Taking actions, so that's looking for where the funding is going to come from. What financing available, what grants is there? What social financing might be available through? Can Credo. Um, review finally then is the, the assess the impacts and really understand what the impacts were. So we hope to achieve X, we got X plus 20% or minus 20%. What was different between what we wanted and what we got? Because you hope to go again and do it another year again and grow from there and share those learnings across the network. So we would say that the, the 30 million euro grant program sits there in stage four. I would like it that before you can go after that 30 million euro, you have to do all the rest. But I'm not in charge just yet, so we have to wait. But yeah, you can go straight for the you can go straight for the grants if you want. We feel it's a stronger path for you to start this way, and that you can repeat year after year and grow grow it that way. So about the 30 million euro. The reason I get into most rooms is because I can talk about the 30 million euro this year in grants. We expect that uh, we expect that we'd be offering about 30 million euro grants for 2017, and that's probably right where the commitments would have been. The letters of offer of the projects that were successful have gone out and are in the process of going out this week. Um, it's an annual call. Um, so this year we opened it around December uh, and it closed on the 17th of February. So you have a very small window of time to pull your project together and work out your financing on it, which means it's all the more reason to go through the energy master planning process and have all that knowledge gained before that date. Um, by the way, some people are scribbling. My presentation is freely available, so if anybody wants it afterwards, there's, there's absolutely no problem with that. We, we really encourage small projects this year, so what we saw in 2012 was we've lots of small projects and then some of those grew into really big projects and we're saying really big projects were for projects that were about 5 million euro in works to be done in less than 6 months. They're huge projects. And certain people that were starting off were kind of going, I'm nowhere near being able to do all that they're doing and they were intimidated by it so they, they didn't apply. But their project was very worthy and it was an ability they could replicate, they could grow it and they could scale it. So we really tried to encourage projects that were looking for grants of less than 75,000 and we said we fast track those. We got very little interest. So we're going to have to look again and see how we can encourage smaller projects to get interest in the programme. It averages out about 30%. In reality, if you're a householder, you can get up to 35% if you're what we can call the can pay sector. So that's typically working or an income and up to 80% if you're in the hand pay or in or at risk of energy poverty. So there's quite a substantial amount of grants available there. Um, if you're commercial, it's around 30%, and if you're not-for-profit, so community charitable organisation, it's 50% funding available. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot there. A big part of the programme is trying to drive innovation, so 25% of the marks goes for innovation. That shouldn't be considered just technical innovation. It's about financial innovation, and that's not about 
line on the checkbook. It's about finding ways to make the financing work in a more creative way, bringing in other partners, looking at pay as you save models. Is there a sinking fund? Are people willing to contribute? How you get your energy credit value and everything else. It's also about structuring the partnership in an innovative way. So what way have you gotten people in? Have you managed to leverage technical support that you don't have to pay for because somebody has donated them from a local technical company and that way you have a resource that you don't have to pay for? And then how can you achieve economies of scale over time? So we asked the, the community <coughs> grant project coordinators after they'd done the work what the experience was and 67% said that they rated the enabling better energy services to improve building comfort as the highest value return from the project. So they would have gone in for financial reasons, but they came out with a comfort reason. The achieving energy savings was second and very close to the, the highest category. Achieving financial savings was after that. And then the ability to influence behavioural change and increasing community engagement was at 33%. So they saw the energy path as a way to leverage other community engagement within their area, which was great. 73% of the projects were on uh, target. So when they assessed how much they'd save, 73% of them were spot on. And 23% exceeded that. And I know what happened to the other 4%, it was one project. So they know what happened to it as well. But it was one project that didn't get as far as they thought they would. But the others all did. So given that that was a project that people were fairly new coming into it, the 73% of them would be spot on in their savings and for nearly a quarter to exceed their expectations. That's huge in a project of this scale. So it's just, that's what people come back and say, the, the expectation going in and how you convince people to engage. Your best advocate is somebody that's had the experience of, a, of an improvement the year before and your worst advocate is the, the one that had a bad experience of the work you did before. So it's really important that the, the reputation is protected. So we have another, other, another number of other community support programs that <coughs> can offer supports in this area. And we developed a local authority renewable energy strategy program, uh, a methodology for local authorities specifically to look within their area what renewable energy potential existed, by which type, and to, to map it out. Um, so it's a structured and consistent approach for local authorities and we provide free training. There's eight modules of training around that to develop this local authority renewable energy strategy. To the best of my knowledge, there were six local authorities that completed it and three are in the process of it out of 30 odd local authorities. So it's still, if you are a community looking to find out what renewable energy options exist for you locally, it's fantastic that you would have one of those available to you and it would be updated on a regular enough basis. There are additional grant programs that are also available to all householders in the country. So there's a Better Energy Home Scheme, there's an ad campaign you may or may not have heard in the last couple of weeks. So that's open to all homes where the house was built before 2006. It's for very basic measures, wall insulation, attic insulation, heating upgrades and solar thermal installs. Um, you apply online, you're approved automatically or you can get a pack sent out to you. Um, and you six months to do the work, you draw it down and you get paid. If you do three measures, you get a 300 euro uh, bonus. If you do four, you get a 400 euro bonus. So we're encouraging people to think a little bit deeper. Then there's the warmer home scheme that I mentioned first, so the one that's been around since 2004, and it's a free attic and cavity wall insulation to end homes that are deemed at risk of energy poverty. So it's family income support, one parent family, uh, job seekers, and the fuel allowance payment would all enable those householders to be eligible for the service. They would also always get a letter from us on an annual basis offering them the service through social welfare. We don't have the database, but we can do a letter in search that way. So all these households have been made aware of it, but sometimes there's a confidence issue, sometimes there's an identification issue. It's not easy to self-identify as, as energy poor either. So sometimes if a group of households, householders go together, locally there might be a bit more confidence in the scheme. We send out a contractor, we pay the contractor, there's absolutely no money required or liability on the householder. So we we believe there's, there's still houses out there that could benefit from the scheme. And then electric vehicles. Um, so there is a, a grant there of up to 5,000 euro for private commercial vehicles private electric vehicles, that's battery and battery hybrid um, electric vehicles, and it's 3,800 if you're looking at a commercial vehicle. There's a phone number there for the ring about any of the schemes if anyone's interested in it. Um, so then looking at the recent programme and, and where it fits and how I, I believe this programme synergy is there, we have a shared ambition across both programmes to increase the capacity of communities to develop their own energy solutions, so that's, that's very much clear in all that we're doing and to share the learnings and increase awareness and showcase community success. So I believe that's that's the opportunity for collaboration between the two programmes. And for me, it's it's still all about the empowering of the energy communities. Um, we have, because of the, the water element, there is a, a map on our website that shows the various connected hydro 
schemes in Ireland and you can go into that map and have a look at it. And there's a couple of guides there as well, given the specific nature of today's event that may be of use. And then this is our call to action, so change the way your community thinks about energy. <laughs> Myself and Gillian are here for the day. If, if anybody wants to, to have any questions with us or ask us any, anything at all, we're more than happy to, to take those questions. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.